Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> I thought after such an energizing presentation, you will all be fired up, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. My name is Albert Zufak. I'm the chief economist for Africa at the World Bank. And it's a great pleasure and honor for me to uh, moderate this panel uh, to get into more uh, in-depth discussion in the findings of this excellent report, and absolutely uh, excellent, and, and, and I'm not saying that just because it's been produced by my colleagues in my office, <laughs> but, but really, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. So I'm, I'm really inviting you to read it, um, because it's clearly coming up with uh, quite you know, innovative findings. The first is that contrary to the gloom and doom picture that we've been seeing on you know, digital uh, technologies displacing workers across the world, what this is finding is that the future of work can actually be brighter in Africa and will be brighter for a good number of reasons. And one of the first reasons is basically that to lose something, you first have to have it. And we don't have that many jobs to start with, right? So, um, so the displacement effect is going to be minimal uh, manufacturing is just 8% of the workforce in Africa. But, but more importantly, this report is uh, pointing to uh, you know, the fact that you know, most of the workforce is informal and technologies, digital technologies can actually you know, help boost productivity of these informal workers and therefore create a brighter picture than we have seen elsewhere. Um, so Africa does have the potential for, and I would even say an opportunity for creating a future of work that is really inclusive. So we need to really ponder on that. And this is coming in contradiction to many reports that have been published not, not long ago. But what I even like more about the, the report and the presentation is that it's not just uh, telling us what may happen. It's telling us you know, how countries can actually achieve that more inclusive future of work. And I like the focus on the three Cs, right? So um, capital, not just physical capital, digital capital as well, but, but more importantly, they need to emphasize uh, the analog complements to digital. We will not do the digital without electricity for example. So the second C is about capacity, the skills. And I love the distinction between the stock and the flow, because number of African you know, do not necessarily uh, have the skills to be uh, you know, uh, creating all those softwares or making money if, you know, from, uh, uh, if, you know, on digital platforms. But they can actually exploit the low-skill digital technologies to create your own employment or to boost productivity of wherever they are. And, and, and I really uh, like that. And, and uh, you know, the other very important finding from the report that I really you know, got from the, the report is this shift in mindset when we discuss informality. It's shifting away from formalization you know, getting a net to trap them and put them into the formal sector like they were cows that we are herding. But the focus on raising their productivity because at the end of the day, when they become large enough, they cannot escape the net. So I think this is a change in mindset and, and we really need to discuss a little bit this further. So um, to get this, I have a wonderful panel here, as you can see. And I'm absolutely happy that uh, 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 Mel uh, is, 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 the, is the minority on the panel. So I'm happy to really have a panel where you know, the gender balance is in favor of uh, you know, the ladies. So uh, it's great. And, and I'm doing this because we are really pushing for women empowerment in Africa in another report that we have written. Now, for this panel, I have next to me Mary Hallward, Dreamer. And, and Mary is a, a senior economic advisor in the uh, you know, finance and competitiveness and innovation uh, global practice at the World Bank. Welcome, Mary. 
So next to Mary is uh, Tricia Williams. And uh, Tricia is from the MasterCard Foundation. And, and you know, she will certainly tell us a little bit more about youth employment and digital uh, employment in the youth. Next to her is Professor Lema Senbet, who is not only uh, a renowned academic at the University of uh, Maryland, the mayor, mayor chair, professor of finance, but also associated to Brookings here. And uh, last but not least is uh, Jean Choi, who is a co-author of this, this report. So welcome to all of you. Um, may I ask you, uh, starting with you, Mary, to very quickly in two, three minutes, having your reaction to these findings, how they align with what you have seen. And you particularly has been involved in a number of analytical work on, 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 the, on the future of work, on manufacturing. You authored this uh, uh, work on uh, uh, trouble in the making. How do you find this report aligning with the existing literature? You know, can you share your, your, sure. your perspective here? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I mean, I really enjoyed uh, this report. And I think, you know, so it was, quote, a companion to uh, a WDR, which took a global perspective. And I think taking it to the region uh, really does highlight a number of, of differences in how the messages and how the agenda may play out. And I think that's actually the team to be commended for, for really doing that and, and adding considerable value in, in that. Um, so I, I have written a global report uh, called Trouble in the Making with a question mark. Um, and in part because it was, it was inspired by this sense of you know, real sort of, oh, not quite panic, but just sort of a sense that technology was going to be wrecking havoc. And so wanting to look at the evidence. Um, and there are some areas that are more concerning than others. So the only twist, unfortunately, I would put on your first lesson um, of there may be fewer jobs to be disrupted and lost, uh, I would say the bigger concern is the jobs that may never come. Right? The, and there is this sort of flying geese model. And, and sort of as raised, you know, China's wages are rising, and this idea that some of the low-skilled, labor-intensive um, manufacturing may shift out of China into other countries, and wouldn't Africa like to be able to have more of it done there? Uh, that that may not be happening. The, the country that is both producing the most robots, importing the most robots, and installing the most robots is China. Right, and so that they are very much sort of aware of this and actively engaged in not having too much of their production um, moving offshore. You know, as wages continue to rise, that may shift, um, but automation may mean a source of potential job creation isn't going to be there in quite the same way. At the same time, I do think there's also a window of opportunity. So one of the things we did try and do was disaggregate across different kinds of technology and different within manufacturing different sectors. So the sectors that Africa is more active in are, in fact, those that are uh, least susceptible to automation. And so it does give some window of opportunity within manufacturing and with other things to be able to gather some of the skills, to get involved in some of this, and be able to potentially keep upgrading. So the, the need to really shift, there may be a little bit um, more time. But what, one of the other things that I think is really interesting is, is in fact that third point, right? Which is really looking at how within the informal sector, uh, this agenda matters. So um, I'm, I'm very much involved in this jobs and economic transformation agenda uh, within the World Bank. And I, and I think it really is, is important sort of for two things. So often we've talked about inclusive growth. So I get asked, how is JET uh, different from inclusive growth? And so to me, this economic transformation is sort of one step down from growth to really where do we see changes? So it's not just that you have this high growth. If it is coming from natural resources, that's not really transformational. It gives you some income, which is good. But to really get the dynamics that are going to change things sort of at scale, you need these deeper changes. So I really like that emphasis on economic transformation. And then I also really like the fact that it's jobs because simplifying two easy ways out of poverty is one is transfers. So you can take some of this income, you can distribute it. That can be a good thing too. But again, it doesn't have that dynamics. The most sustainable way out of poverty is by increasing job, increasing job opportunities, increasing labor income, right? That is by far the labor's sort of the most important asset for the poor. Being able to use that more productively is critical. So, so to me, this shifting the sort of 
inclusive growth to economic transformation and jobs is focusing that much more closely on what we need to do. And I think this report, in looking at the informal sector, where the vast majority of the people are, is appropriate and comes up with a lot of ways which is different from what we usually hear about how these kinds of technologies really can be productivity enhancing. So I think this report is putting on the table a sort of a whole set of agenda, and they've got some evidence. Uh, it's an agenda where we need to keep building that evidence. Um, but that, to me, is, is, a, is a huge contribution, is not just assuming that this is all skill biased, that there's some really important, simple ways that this can be making a difference on the ground. So very much congratulations to the team. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. And, uh, and I think the team really deserves uh, those congratulations, you know, as they have said. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Trish, so Tisha, you've uh, been working on Africa with the uh, MasterCard Foundation. One of the areas this report is highlighting is the need to build those skills. And skills are certainly digital skills. And when we generally think digital skills, people think of coding, of uh, tertiary level uh, skills. But, but what this report is also saying is, you know, technology may actually be coming with some potential for lowly educated people, low skilled people, but that could be transformative as well. There are examples of farmers receiving extension messages on their phones, not smartphones, just simple phones, text messaging as a way to actually promote uh, agricultural extension voice, you know, for alphabetization programs, you know, all those that could actually help boosting productivity. Can you share a little bit your perspective from the MasterCard uh, Foundation, uh, you know, view? Um, what kind of digital skills do you see uh, being really implemented and making a difference in Africa? Well, thank you so much for the invitation, the opportunity to be here. Um, as Cool said, uh, the MasterCard Foundation is focused in Africa. We are um, separate and independent from the MasterCard Corporation, endowed by a generous one-time gift from the co corporation. Um, and we're working currently across several countries in Africa, working specifically on youth employment. So we think about work all the time, Africa, and this is, this is what we're, we're primarily focused on. So a couple maybe comments first before I get to the point about digital skills. Mm. So I think this is really, an, as Mary said, an important contribution in, in localizing and regionalizing the discussion on future wor of work. So I think it's an important step forward, but I would hope it's just the first step of many because I think what we've observed is the need for more of this dialogue to happen in different countries, by different actors, that there needs to be more attention to the future of work and to really maybe pro provide different frameworks, different narratives, um, rather than interpreting the, the traditional narratives around automation, the gig economy, et cetera. Um, and one of the things I guess I think I'd put forward is that maybe we've overemphasized technology a bit. Given how many people are living in an analog world, although technology will play a big role in, in the present and future, I think some of these things are maybe underemphasized in how much they're going to shape work opportunities in Africa and elsewhere. And notably, you know, I think they've been pointed out here in this report as risks, but I think they might even be considered drivers. So climate change will cause m big displacements of people from different areas that will, that will really shape work opportunities. Same with global value change, the jobs that might never come, um, social inclusion as well. And then the other thing I think I'd say maybe before addressing the digital skills part is I think we have to go a little bit farther in, in surfacing the critical decisions that are, are most important right now. So in a world in which, you know, governments are saying to us all the time, this is great, you want to focus on youth employment with us because we have a big youth employment problem of today. So n not like making the trade-offs between what are the problems of today and what are the problems of 10, 20 years out. So where are the things where we actually really have critical windows of opportunity to make differences right now? Because that's a really ambitious policy list that was put up in this report. And I think it would be, it would be good to have more discussion about where are the things that we actually have a window of opportunity to make changes right now and that will really determine some of the future pathways. Um, in terms of digital skills, I mean, we're, we're working closely with, um, as I said, in a number of countries, and 
We have a, a report coming out very soon with Caribou Digital around transformational upskilling, which is a really exciting thing that we're seeing with different platforms who are investing in worker skills. So you're starting to see businesses seeing the potential of investing in their worker skills. So for instance, Jumia, people know Jumia, you know, in Africa, they're selling their things online, but they're actually teaching people how to take better photos of their products to put them online. Or Link in Kenya, linking informal workers. They're saying, you know, we're gonna set up a carpentry shop so that our carpenters are better skilled and can provide better services to the customers on the platform. So this is taking different forms. So you're starting to see some real um, investment not only in the analog skills but the digital skills as well so I think you know we'd say that it's really going to be in, in in hand in hand the analog and the digital skills together excellent thank you so much so professor Lema by the way coming I, to you I like this report okay <laughs> so I enjoyed reading this report I think what I liked uh, was that it has an opportunity to shift the conversation um, the, I like the idea that uh, this old thesis, let's call this old, which is uh, kind of grappling with job losses associated with manufacturing, and then uh, maybe creating these new sectors. By the way, they have never explicit about what these new sectors are, right? We don't know, but that's what they say. Um, I think the point of this paper is that there is no old and there's no new. There is just a sector. Mm -hmm. And this is pretty analogous to this debate that has gone on for a long time about this premature disinterpretation of Africa. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Which I think is a wrong debate. Mm -hmm. Because the thinking is that you, know, you have to move from agriculture, manufacture, but you have to transform everywhere. Mm -hmm. You have to create value, value chain. The conversation has to be value. So this is pretty analogous, analogous to that. So then this, the second point is that, you know, Africa has staggering problems. I think what um, Albert did not mention is that uh, I decided to go on a five-year mission to Africa. I was actually heading up African Economic Research Consortium. The university was very generous, gave me a long leave of absence. Then I got to see Virtually the whole continent. Whenever I run into a governor of central bank of a specific country, I say, I know more about Africa than you do. <laughs> yeah. So but, but what I noticed was that one day I just woke up. So the problems are so staggering. You can't do this. You can't deal with that business as usual. You have to go outside the box. You have to innovate. You know, the, 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 the whole emphasis of, on innovation, entrepreneurship, has to be part of a robust conversation, part of support coming from the other entities. So, um, so by the way, innovation, I'm actually defining it more broadly. I'm not giving total technology. By the way, innovation has been going on since time memorial, right? Sure. Before all of you were born. The Roman Empire. <laughs> yeah. In fact, one thing, that they don't, one thing that people do not know is when they talk about the Mfesa in Kenya, is that there was another entity called Equity Bank. This Equity Bank with a, no, te no technology, but was able to identify neglected areas and which are shunned by post-colonial banks like you know, Barclays. And he, this guy decided to go into this arid desert area. By the way, he did that to make money. Okay. And he created a not simple, this microfinance entity. Now, this has become sometimes the largest, sometimes the second largest, and got listed in the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So this is like transforming informal finance into the stock market. So innovation could occur without technology. I, I think that's one of the points that you were seeing. So really, the, the, one thing that I would like you to encourage is, is what does it mean to innovate in various sectors, especially agriculture? That's a dominant, a dominant economy in Africa. Mm -hmm. We need to innovate in agriculture. Innovate both entrepreneurially, both in terms of value chain, and uh, the really the report is not that explicit. Is that right? So we need to go into the nitty gritty of what, is, what does it mean to innovate 
And how do we create an enabling environment? Uh, agriculture really being uh, important. And, and second is, um, I, I agree with your policies, competition policies. You know, uh, basically not a stifling uh, entry, and uh, even playing field. Uh, that's uh, that's definitely uh, a very good suggestion. But I think one thing that we are, we keep on ignoring, and that's something became very close to uh, my thinking in Africa was the political economy. Mm -hmm. The political, you know, we come up with very well designed instruments, features, and policies. Who is going to implement this? And when would that be implemented? So the, the and now we have come up uh, with the largest trading block in the entire globe, by the way, in terms of population. Yeah, I'm, yes, semi-optimistic. <laughs> Now, I think, if, assuming that that also works, uh, talking about how integrating you know, these uh, thin, um, small markets and integrated innovation across national boundaries is something that I think we should actually look into uh, in this paper as well. And then finally, um, one thing that I liked about Kenya, by the way. I, I, my headquarters was Kenya, but I'm, I was going around the whole continent, it's a pan-African. I was spending more time on the sky <laughs> than on the ground. But one thing about Kenya is it's a very entrepreneurial, innovative group, the, especially the young guys. And, uh, uh, and, and then every time people ask me, like I was of Ethiopian origin, in other countries, I say, no, you know, walk across the board, <laughs> see what's going on. But one of the, uh, the big issues, and I don't want to single out Kenya necessarily, I think when we draw up policies, we should also think about corruption, or the anti-corruption policies. Because there are certain countries who seem to have all kinds of ingredients, including, by the way, skills uh, in Kenya. Uh, they can only go so far, is that right? And there is some binding <laughs> constraint. So, so, so really, the political economy, the, the anti-corruption policies, by the way, policies do not alone even in anti-corruption policies, do not get implemented. And I'm going to finish with this. Okay. One day, uh, I woke up in the morning, and they have a, by the way, the media in, in, in Nairobi is very robust. And there is a thing called Nation. So kind of, I kind of look forward to reading the Nation. It's almost like the Washington Post. So someday, I just woke up. The fourth point, she says, shame list. This is a list of who is who implicated in corruption. <laughs> okay. Then I thought that, this is going to make a big difference. And then in a month, the news disappeared. Okay? And I think part of the reason was that uh, people started asking, yeah, you have a shame list. How about two or three individuals who are off the list? And they singled out you know, someone who is very closely aligned with the decision makers. So, so even when you have these anti-corruption policies, you will have difficulty implementing them. So, anyway, thank thank you very much, uh, Lema. Thank you. Now, uh, Jun, you are the third quarter, <laughs> and you are on this panel not to defend yourself, but yeah. you know, I would, I would like you to, <laughs> to yeah. react to some of the points. You know, what I'm hearing is a, a broad uh, agreement that you know the report is timely, is helpful, is raising very, very uh, pertinent questions, complementing the WDR 2019. Um, but there are also some questions, you know. Um, you, you know, what about the jobs that may never come? Um, are we overplaying the technology card? Um, you know, how about youth entrepreneurship? You know, um, then, then the political economy, as we hear from Lema, you know, um, corruption, all these things, you know, how do you react to all this uh, first barrage? Yes, uh, I th first of all, I want to thank all the three uh, panelists for your very insightful comments. Some of them are actually addressed in our report, and then uh, those we have not addressed uh, extensively, maybe we can consider uh, addressing further in our upcoming digital mm -hmm. economy flagship. So uh, specifically, I agree with uh, Mary that uh, growth is a necessary but not sufficient condition for job creation. And I also agree with Tricia that uh, we need a more than digital technology, that we need a complementary analog asset. And also with the lemma that uh, uh, 
we should, there is no old and new sector. Any sector can innovate. Yes. Uh, and then also the point about uh, digital technology is uh, important. That uh, It's not we are only emphasizing digital technology. We use a digital technology as a, a cross-cutting theme, which can be used in agriculture sector, which we can be used in service sector. We are not saying we should develop ICT sector in Africa. We should use digital technology to transform uh, different sectors. So that's, I think, our key point. Uh, in terms of Mary's point about that uh, jobs may never come to Africa, you are right that uh, China may not offshore their production. And also, as we may, as we all know, that Adidas closed down their factory in Bangladesh and opened it up in uh, Germany because of producing shoes with a 3D uh, printing is cheaper in Germany. Mm -hmm. So maybe such a reshoring uh, raises a concern for African countries that. Uh, maybe they cannot uh, follow the traditional industrialization-led growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, our report reviewed uh, such evidence, and we saw that uh, uh, such a reshoring is very limited in globally as of today, and then uh, much more limited in Africa. So we just argue that we are not saying we have a lot of opportunity. We are just arguing that there is urgency for African countries to act uh, because they may have a, they still have a time to uh, take advantage of uh, low wages and globalization. But I also admit that they should also explore new growth paths, uh, which te uh, technology can open up. So the last uh, Lema's point about the political economy, yes, uh, it is true. So it's related also to Trisha's point that uh, upskilling and digital technology, such as uh, Jumia or M-Pesa, uh, it is true that uh, private sector driven such as digital upskilling or uh, uh, increasing uh, e-commerce. But I think government has an important role uh, making this such a technology more inclusive. The one example is Alibaba, as a Taobao village in China. So Taobao village is essentially built on uh, government transfer to the rural area and making such uh, e-commerce more inclusive. So yes, there is a political economy. So such an industrial policy or government intervention can bring a good outcome, but also can bring a disaster like corruption and all sorts. So how do we do it is important. But like just to conclude, I think we have a great opportunity today to inform policy discussion and then support such a government because big data is a complementing traditional source of data and also expanding our knowledge. For, ex for example, uh, using LinkedIn data, our report shows that digital skill has been growing in 27 African countries, such an information we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. And also there has been emerging micro-level evidence, uh, including field experiment about digital app or digital technologies effect on inclusion. I think we should take advantage of a such rich data source and microeconomics tool to really understand, uh, really investigate the best possible policy intervention the government should do, and then develop partner where scholars should work together with the government. And some of the question we could answer, we could investigate is what are the efficient uh, market structure for to make a technology affordable for all? Or what are the uh, specific technology we should emphasize making, uh, supporting more low skilled or low educated workers? So all those questions can be addressed today. And I think uh, the fact that this week, uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize uh, awarded by two uh, development economists, three. which encouraging three. us to, three, three. three, yeah. three. Yeah. which are encouraging us to supporting evidence-based policy making. Yes, yes. Excellent, That's thank right. you so much. Um, no, no, these are great answers. Now, um, I think one word that had kept coming up before I opened the floor, one word that, you know, one, one uh, uh, expression that kept coming up is window of opportunity, right? Window of opportunity, how large it is, how small it is, that's certainly a question for investigation. But when you visit a city like Hawassa in Ethiopia and realize that over the past five years, they have actually attracted more than 20,000 manufacturing jobs and growing, mm -hmm. then you realize that, you know, um, you know uh, robots and 3D printing are not going to invade Africa tomorrow morning, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we, we probably still have some time before it happens. The question is how fast, you know, those uh, technologies are going to be preventing those jobs from coming to Africa. And, and more importantly, I think the point that came out here also is uh, this idea of leapfrogging, this idea of a different development path, and this idea of leveraging technology for all sectors, including manufacturing, because manufacturing is changing itself, right? So digital can actually help, you know, improving the way we function in manufacturing. And agreeing with Lema, 
the uh, debate on uh, premature deindustrialization may not be the most relevant one. And by the way, we do have a paper mm -hmm. which is actually, uh, you know, contesting that that finding. Anyway, so the floor is open. Raise your hand, please. Introduce yourself. Keep your question short so that we can take as many as possible. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, about a century ago, John Maynard Keynes predicted that by now people would be working 15 hours a week, and they'd be working 15 hours a week because they would not be comfortable working less than that. It turns out since that time, productivity increase has been even greater than he'd predicted. And I can tell you as a retired engineer that there are no jobs that are not susceptible to automation. Mm -hmm. We can talk in detail later. Absolutely. Now... If you look at the informal agricultural sector, averaged around the year, people are working less than 20 hours a week. Should Africa really accept the Western standard of 40-hour work week, or should Africa just take advantage of the fact that you're actually getting into this late and start with a 20 or 15-hour work week as the standard expectation? Thank you very much. Next Please introduce yourself and just behind you. And, uh, uh, I like and please, the, uh, please mention if you're directing your question to one oh, member well, specifically. I, I, or because of the report is uh, a, a collaborative effort. It's to anybody who wants to answer. Okay. But, um, and I, uh, what I like about in your report is that you're stressing the importance of innovation. Because what uh, the uh, I recall, IBM was told by the federal government, "You have to share your code." It was part of the uh, agreement with the government: share your code. And then IBM became the platform for a lot of innovation. The problem you have is the problem that China is now facing with American industry today. The, the corp big corporations want to keep their code like Coca-Cola keeps their code in a vault. Can't do it. You will never get innovation that way. It's got to be shared. The university isn't enough. You've got to go train uh, these unskilled workers in, in Africa. And you've got to uh, rely on industry to supply those educators to train them. Now, that's how it's done. And you people who are in uh, venture capital, it's important. I, I can't emphasize how wonderful that there's a group of, of bankers here because that's where the problem lies. Until you say to uh, a venture, to uh, an uh, to, to uh, innovator, you share your, anything you get, you're willing to share. If it's commercial, you share it. And uh, even if it means that eventually you'll be out of business and venture capital deals with that every day. But the problem lies with the banker. If we can get bankers to uh, uh, understand the nature of innovation, it requires a platform. Okay, thank you so much. I have a question here in front, please. And then you, sir. Lambre Signé and I'm a fellow here at the Brookings Institution Africa Growth Initiative. Uh, congratulations on an excellent report as uh, usual. Uh, I have a question, especially as I have a forthcoming book on Africa's role in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, riding the world's biggest disruptive innovation. So can you be more specific about the opportunities uh, that a leader planning for the next 10 years, 20 years, and developing specific program in order to offer the opportunities uh, to the uh, youth? Uh, what should they be doing? We know that by 2035, about 450 jobs uh, will be needed out of which 100 Million, 450 million of jobs will be needed in the continent, uh, a month which about 100 million could be anticipated of quality jobs. So 
what would you advise the leader to do to address the 300 million remaining one? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, the gentleman behind you, please. Hi, thanks. Enjoyed the panel. My name is Lafcadio. I'm um, interested uh, because you are uh, talking about investing in, in human capital. How you guys are accounting for brain drain if people wanted to leave immediately after? You know, you could make much more money in Silicon Valley or something like that. And then also, how do you take into account the concentration of wealth? I think you guys had mentioned uh, Uber as an example. How can you make sure that it's African companies and technologies that are, are benefiting from this innovation. Mm. Excellent. Should we take two more and, uh, and then get a, a round of answers? Yes, here, please. Can you introduce yourself, please? For Hi, the, uh, my name is Emily Eisen. Hi, my name is Emily Eisenhower. Uh, I wanted to ask about so in the United States, the tech field has a reputation of being male dominated, and thinking about windows of opportunity, I wanted to ask about you know what are you seeing in terms of gender disparities in the field in Africa, and what can be done to address that? Excellent. And one last question, just behind there. Yes, thank you. Hello, this is Lashto. I'm a research fellow here at Brookings Institution. So I have a question about the role of competition policy in the telecom sector because, um, as you know, many of the digital economies are value-adding on top of technology services such as SMS and data and other uh, voice and similar uh, 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 services. And so companies, the way telecom companies are structured, how competitive the telecom sector is can define the outlook of the future of work, the way the digital economy is, uh, happens in, in practice. So if you take the case of Kenya, for example, telecom, uh, Safaricom is known for pioneering in PESA, mm -hmm. uh, which is a famous mobile banking service. Uh, and Safaricom is often accused of being a monopoly firm and having a close tie with the government. So do you think that the telecom sector should be more competitive or should it be more uh, should, should it work closely with the government to ensure that there's a more uh, level playing field? Great. So I got a number of questions here for our excellent panel. So um, should Africans work less? <laughs> That's a big one. 20 hours per week. Well, should I ask Mary to handle this one? <laughs> Right, so obviously those 20 hours a week vary enormously from times of the year when it's 100 and times when it's very close to zero. So I'm sure the preference of smoothing it out would be there if that was even an option. I mean, some of it comes to standard of living, right? Uh, so I'm guessing our standard of living may still be higher than what Keynes thought it might have been when he said this a uh, long time ago. Um, I think it gets very, so I think some of it is an individual choice on how much people want to work than necessarily putting some kind of regulation as to what it might be. Different countries are debating this in different ways. Some of that's a political question. Um, but I think a lot of it also is the standard of living that people are going to want um, to be able to have. But I mean, one of the things that's also of interest, right, you think about the gig economy, is it actually gives an individual a fair amount of control uh, over how, what kind of hours, when, and, and flexibility. Um, you know, there's also some concerns to make sure people aren't getting abused in how, what those would be. So there's, as always, trade-offs. So there is this possibility in a number of these digitally enabled work to give more flexibility to the worker and recognition that there may be also new risks that they're, they're being um, exposed to. So I think there's going to need to be sort of continuous sort of looking at what some of those trade-offs would be too. And I, and I guess if I may add something, you know, it's, on, it's, it's all about productivity, right? You know, if... Uh, we could raise productivity for, of agriculture in Africa, which has been stagnant for the past two decades. If we could raise productivity in agriculture by introducing more uh, technology, more mechanization, more irrigation, for example, yeah, definitely the number of hours worked by our, our, our farmers would, would clearly decline. So it's certainly about you know, raising productivity across the board for sure. Now, no, next I, question, yeah? I was just gonna jump in there yes. and say, I, I mean, I'd love to know where those mm -hmm. 20 hours a week comes from. I mean, we did some some studies a couple years ago where we looked at young people over a whole period of, of a whole year mm -hmm. in rural Ghana, rural Uganda, 
and we had them count the number of hours they spent on different activities. And what we found was they did a lot of different things, and women especially did way more. Oh yeah. You know, way oh, more yeah. on the non or what we would call like the reproductive activities, the family, the caregiving. I think it counts as work. Yes. <laughs> Having young toddler <laughs> home, I can tell you it's work. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's should we? Yeah. Uh, uh, Trish, should we? Can can you? Build on that and address the gender divide question. Do you see that in, in the field, in your work with MasterCard? So, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, we, as Cool said in the introduction, we set a target of um, enabling 30 million young Africans to have dignified and fulfilling work by 2030. And, you know, 30 million is an awful lot of people, but it isn't nearly, it's like 10% of the estimated challenge by then. So we're, we're just a drop in the bucket. And we said to ourselves that we wanted 70% of those to be young women. And then we take a deep gulp and we look out there and we talk to different partners and we say, how are we going to actually reach women? And not just in the tech sector, but, you know, across all sectors and all different opportunities. And unsurprisingly, this is really difficult. You know, and one of the things we are committed to is building the evidence for what's working, for whom, and under what conditions. So can we build more understanding of what the actual interventions are that are going to actually, you know, privilege women's opportunities? Um, and it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I, I don't think we find many things that naturally or that people are just thinking of it on their own. It's, it often requires an intentional focus on gender inclusion to bring that to the surface. Great. Professor Sam, Lemon, yes. Lemon Sam, but you, there's, there's a question here on um, you know, financing. Mm -hmm. uh, venture capital and uh, bankers. Can bankers actually be expected to finance innovation? I'm not sure it's work anywhere. Venture capital, uh, you know, how will Africa finance this digital revolution? Professor Sam, but. Okay, um, let me be, begin by saying that uh, there's already homegrown innovation taking place in Africa. And it's, it's actually showing mostly in the form of fintechs. And I was actually preparing once a report for the World Bank, and I was kind of mapping what the heck is going on. And in a matter of two years, you have hundreds of fintechs, and they have uh, actually begun attracting many not just from the donors. I started seeing that they're actually getting money from Silicon Valley. So, so the issue is not that these guys are not innovating. The issue is really having, enabling, enhanced envir environment for them to innovate and scale more. So uh, this is happening in Nigeria, in Kenya, and, and, and also South Africa. Again, in terms of innovation, innovation doesn't depend on the institutional design of a financial institution or a bank. Innovation could occur anywhere. Very similar to the argument that we make about uh, sectors, right? So um, now, the, I have a big issue that we're facing in Africa is the scale. Very thin markets yeah. and disparate, fragmented. And I'm hoping that this big show that took place in Rwanda, you know, with AFC of TA, would actually help uh, change that. Um, so the, the answer uh, for your question is that, yeah, as long as there are opportunities and incentives, innovation, financial innovation can occur in, in a number of ways, and it's, it's actually happening, but it's not moving, moving as fast. I think in that context, somebody asked a question about Safaricom yeah. and competition policies. Yes, can you handle uh, that as well? The, this is also one thing that we have to be careful about because there is now growing digital financial services. Mm -hmm. So one issue that we are facing is how do you regulate digital financial services? And typically, they are under multiple jurisdictions. So it takes like mobile bank. So you have a, a telephone <laughs> company, and then there's also a banking service, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, should it be regulated by a banker, a banking regulator, or a telecom regulator? So I was uh, sitting on this Global Financial Inclusion Task Force in Washington. We debated on this, and we, thought we, we decided that was the wrong question. It turns out that you have to do that by functions. Okay? If somebody is providing a banking service, I don't care where they are, they should be regulated as the providers of banking. So uh, 
Now, the, 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 this, this Kenya is one of those countries which is actually getting ahead in, in this environment. I'm not, I'm not sure that uh, Safaricom is captured by the government. I, I just don't believe that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yep. Jen, mm -hmm. you've heard all this interesting yeah. discussion yeah. and questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as a quarter of the report, what do you have to say on behalf of the team as, as closing? What are the uh, key messages you believe people should go home with? Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah, and that, I think that's going to be, you know, the closing of our panel. Yes. Go ahead, please. I think our report can be summarized in one sentence. Future of work in Africa could be bright if government move quickly. That's it from me. Excellent. <laughs> That's extremely brief and sharp. Thank you so much. And I would like you to uh, you know, acknowledge this uh, wonderful panel for me, please. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.